Damien Ferry here, live from the Unshackled, and we are at an event organised by the True Blue Crew, and it is called the Aussie Pride March. Now, what we have today is an event that signifies what it means to be an Australian. We have a march that's going to proceed um, down in Hyde Park in Sydney CBD. We're going to march over to the Parliament House, New South Wales Parliament House, there's going to be several speakers at the event that's going to talk about their experiences and what we need to do to regroup as a nation and unify. And we just want to basically announce that we're not ashamed being who we are. We, these days, are continually told by Marxists, leftists, the media to despise and have shame for who we are and what we have created. Now, what does it mean to be an Australian? Does it have to do with race, culture, background, traditions, customs? It has to do with everything, all of those things and more. What the most important factor is, is that we have a respect for the foundations that have built this country and that we carry the values on to our children and grandchildren. We don't want to buy the spin that the universities have been programming people to think we want to make sure that we remain true to our ancestors to continue on the great traditions that have built this country <laughs> should we go again <laughs> coming today. Love you all. Love Australia. Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. 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 Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. We've got a few people that just want to say a few words and thank you for all for all coming. We love Australia. We love our culture. And we're just, this is just a pride must just say, we're loving our country. We're loving being here. That's it. So our first speaker is Thomas Hopper. Thomas is a 19-year-old university student doing a double degree in law and economics. He's a member of the Lad Society. He holds strong nationalist views and one day hopes to enter into politics. So, thanks Thomas. Come and give us a few words. I want to thank you 
all for uh, being here today with all of us. It's a truly meaningful uh, experience for me and everybody else, uh, everybody else around here, I'm sure. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for ce celebrating our great nation. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to talk about how the man I am today is solely due to this country. I have learned the values of strength, camaraderie, kinship, resourcefulness and intelligence from living in this beautiful country. And I am proud and I know I am lucky to live in this country and I will always defend this country. Yeah. Yeah. Now we can rally and we can talk about how great Australia is but we have to recognise that there is a problem in the current political climate. Yes. 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 Nationalists in today's age are basically compared to the devil by the media. The government condemns us and in the academia they teach our children that we are the very scum of this earth. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't recognize this, you are absolutely ignorant to the current political situation. We only have to look at figures like Tommy Robinson or Blair Cottrell. Tommy Robinson was put into prison for simply covering a Muslim court case where there were a bunch of pedophiles and he got locked up for the reason that he was preaching to me. Furthermore, Blake Cottrell, he isn't currently having to deal with the Victoria state due to offending Muslims. This is the current climate of Australia. And Nationalists yet, are suppressed. And Do yet, not tell me that we live in a free country when Antifa can destroy property and they're left alone, but we get left off, locked up for four That's time. right. Yeah. And yeah. The, Muslim girl, the Muslim girl that had the, had the, the, the plastic semi-automatic gun at the hospital, she got off with a warning. Get off with a warning. If, if we did that with a plastic gun, we'd be in 100%, jail. 100%. Yeah. Nationalists in the media, we're called losers for wanting to defend this beautiful country. But if a man in Hollywood drops off his penis and says he's another gender, he's an absolute <laughs> hero. Yeah. He's a hero. But we're the losers. We're just idiots. Well, the thing is that they have to wake up that our movement is rising and it is growing and we will take this country back. Yeah! 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 Rappers rap about killing people, doing hard drugs, having promiscuous sex. By the media standards, they're now our cultural icons. Yes. Uh, idiots like Kim Kardashian are the, are the new face of women. Uh, everything else like that. Everything is promoted except us. Why? Because we are the only healthy alternative to this country. Yeah. Yeah. Everything unnatural, everything subverted is being pushed except for us because we pose a real threat to the status quo. It's not Antifa. They're the foot soldiers of the status quo. Yeah. The reason also that I have the courage and I had the passion to come up here today was due to the fact that I educated myself. I educated myself through books that weren't prescribed by my high school teachers. I educated myself through books that weren't prescribed by my university professors. I read books that I won't recommend it, and through those books I learned to love my country and defend it against everything that threatens it. Yeah! And the reason that our high school teachers and our university professors don't recommend these books is because it teaches us to stand up against the exploitation that we're currently facing against international bankers that are taking everything from us. Yeah! Everything! They are ruthless! Yeah. We have a country that they don't. They're everywhere but anywhere but us. We have a soil and we have to defend it against anything that threatens it. And they are currently taking everything from us. They are dividing our society. They are dividing our society very aggressively through this mass, mass immigration. They're dividing our society through this new wave of gender theory, this new radical feminism, this new age of Marxism, which is all being pushed by our universities. It is no coincidence that all of these Antifa idiots are coming straight out of university, because universities are propaganda machines. Yeah. Yeah. The way we fix this mass division in our communities, which I absolutely hate, is to recreate a national spirit, a national unity, yeah. one that can fight against this division. Yeah. But this national unity won't be achieved by sorry. This national community won't be achieved by sending a letter to Malcolm Turnbull. It won't be achieved by signing a petition. It will be achieved through our very own will, our own determination, our own struggle. Because struggle is the law of nature. And nature only rewards those who embrace struggle the most. We must embrace it until we become one again. Because until then, the media, the academia, the government, they will aggressively attack us until we are gone or until we have succeeded. That's accurate. Yeah. I didn't do the 2004 across the bridge for nothing. We did that for reconciliation and anyway, we were a champion. Anyway, all I want to say here was today that we have to 
really work hard towards the future and we have to create a new national community and we have to put aside all of this Antifa and cultural Marxism that is currently happening. I want you, all of you, to, con con to continually educate yourselves and to continually educate those around you that you have to believe that this nation is worth protecting against everybody of that because it is only once we turn our members of society to our group that we can succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. All right, we got someone else going to say a few words. We have old mate Harry Jacobax. Harry grew up in rural New South Wales from a German immigrant family who was taught to assimilate into Australia and to love the country that took him in. Harry has taken these values and is, and is a dedicated activist, focused on protecting Aussie values and culture. He is the founder of the Australian Day Flag Convoy. Here's Harry now. Thanks, Harry. Okay, thank you all for being here. Now, I'm not the most articulate uh, public speaker you've ever heard, so you just have to bear with me. Uh, but I do have a very important message I want to uh, bring to you today. And that is about the significance of saving Australia Day. Australia Day is at the core of our culture, at the core of our every being, our every fibre. And as we all know, there's been a big push to change the date and to undermine it, led by Richard D. Natale and the Watermelon Green. Oh, yeah. um, changing the date is just the tip of the iceberg. Their idea is to undermine our cultural identity completely. Uh, once the date is moved, they'll rename it to something else and it'll be turned into a multicultural festival where Aussie flags will be replaced by rainbow banners and ISIS flags instead. Yeah. Burn Australia to the ground. That's what they're telling us. That's their cry. We will lose our identity. We will lose everything. So I'm saying here today that of all the things that we must defend, it must be Australia Day. Good news is, I've made it my mission to do just that. And uh, I will not even contemplate failure. But for this to work, all of us need to be participants uh, in what I'm about to propose. Um, I've come up with a statement that we can all make on Australia Day each and every year on January 26th to say that we mean business we will not have it messed with and that statement is that involved getting all our cars and bikes and whatever else we have together assembled in one location where we can smother them with the Australian flags just a, and drive go for a mad drive in a convoy through your town with all these flags on board like a huge public display every town, every city and you, so you drive through and you meet at a park somewhere where you can have a, a really excellent family uh, fun day like we do on every Australia day with a barbecue and a picnic and all the flags and all the pine up and a car park full of cars mothered in Aussie flags. Yeah. Okay. okay, next up we have El Marcela. Earl lives in Sydney and is board member and is a board member of Reclaim Australia New South Wales. Earl has seen the bad effects of the change of culture in Australia when she worked as a nurse and treated many people for female genital mutilation. She now works hard to protect Australian culture from barbaric subcultures infecting Australia. She regularly travels to speak about the dangers of these barbaric subcultures and it is here today to speak to us now. So thanks, Elf.
Hi everyone. I've been a nurse for 40 years. And I think there's a couple of nurses here in the audience, the famous me. We're hospital trained. 40 years, 30 years, 20 years ago, we didn't have this sort of culture imposing on our culture. But what I have had to experience recently working in the Smithfield, Regents Park, Auburn area is looking after women from another culture. Yes, I work for a doctor who was from Iraq. He was Islamic. He did not believe in their practices because believe it or not, Iraq does not participate in FGM. The main countries in this world that participate in FGM, and if you don't know what it is, female genital mutilation, mm. is Afghanistan, Somalia, and the Indonesia. So Iraq and Iran, Lebanon, and Turkey are not as much. But what we are experiencing now is seeing it here in Australia. We have had two cases go to the courts, one in Sydney, one in Brisbane. They got the absolute menial sentences on this. The Brisbane one's still going, the Sydney one was finalised. The only reason the Sydney one made the papers, or actually got to the, as far as the court, was the eight-year-old little girl confided in her eight-year-old classmate that she was sore down there. And that went to the counsellor, the first teacher, and on from there. Now there's four forms of FGM. One's a little nick, that's stage one. The next one is to take off the hood, that's stage two. The next one is to actually take off the whole of the clitoris and stitch up partially, that's stage three. And the fourth stage is when they take off the labia minor, labia major and the clitoris and stitch the women up. Stage one and two are tolerable for the health side reason. Stage three, when they're stitched up, the women are left with a hole as big as these four cotton buds together to not only menstruate from, but to also urinate from. When you come down to stage four, the hole is the size of one single cotton bud tip. Now, I've had to perform pap smears on some of these women, and I've had to sedate them with Valium and the green pen that the ambulance officers use in order to be able to just get them to open their legs for a minor medical procedure. I don't know of any men who need to be sedated before they have a prostate check. So these things are encroaching. If any of your children or your grandchildren come home and say, I've got a friend at school and she's got a problem, please help that little friend out if you can. Now, my second topic, our constitution. We are losing our law here. We are losing our rights. We have seen what went through with the dual citizenship. We've recently seen what went through with the family first now Liberal Party Senator in South Australia. How many people here have written in under freedom of information to find out if she's a dual citizen? How many have written in to find out if anybody else under FOI is a dual citizen? This is what you've got to do, people. You've got to write in and get information, get the facts. The only reason that the dual citizens came to light was because a Western Australia barrister pushed the issue. Now, Section 44, they cannot be dual citizens. They cannot have allegiance to another power. Section 109 states, if state and federal law contradict, federal law rules. Federal law is Section 44. Therefore, those sitting in this house behind us that hold dual citizenship are not legally entitled to be there because the federal law rules over state. And we need to be asking our state parliament who are dual citizens. The third part of my speech is our water rights. Every year, people in Queensland and the Northern Territory and the top end of Western Australia suffer from cyclones, masses and masses of amounts of rain. And where does it go? Back out in the ocean. Our farmers are suffering. They do not have water. We are in one of the biggest droughts again in this country. And no one is doing anything about it. About 18 months ago, I attended a function here in Sydney. Richard Di Natale was the guest speaker. At the end of the night, 
I asked him a question. I said, Richard, why, why can't we put dams in the top end of Queensland and pipe the water down through the centre the same way the Murrumbidgee, the Snowy Mountains and even Perth to Kalgoorlie pipeline went in? And his comment to me was, no, we can't do that, it's too costly, too expensive. I said, oh, you've done the costings on it, have you? Could I please see the paperwork on the costings? He said, no, we haven't done the costings. I said, so how can you determine that something is too expensive when you haven't even done the costings? The massive amount of water that we could conserve from our monsoon rains would help our farmers in all the states. It is just going to waste. We don't need a bloody stadium here in Sydney to replace what we've got. We need a pipeline and water rights. Farmers are being charged for the water that they have in their storage dams on their own property that they already pay land rates on. And most recently, our hero, our hay run hero, lost a best friend to suicide because he could not keep going on his farm with today's um, allotment. Ten years ago, when I got an inheritance from my father's estate, I spent $2,000. I went and bought sleeping bags, pillows, a $50 Woolworths card each, and I spent that and handed it out to the homeless. I am about to receive quite a substantial inheritance from my mother's estate, and what I intend to do with that is to put together grocery hampers because the farmers out there are foregoing their own food, their own detergent, their own soap and toothpaste so that they've got money to feed their cattle. And I, with a girlfriend, Elizabeth Power, will be touring, touring the west of Australia, New South Wales, and delivering as much as $40,000 worth of hampers to farms out there. I don't know these people, but they need our help from the city. So, anybody wants to help out there, greatly appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you, Ellie. Just, just on that, um, it is, I think there is a big problem. Like, we, we have the laws here in Australia. There's a big thing about enforcement of the laws. Yeah, we, we have all these laws, but they're not being enforced, and I think that's a big problem that's been touched on there. Uh, our next speaker is Ricardo Bossi. Ricardo is a former Australian Special Forces Lieutenant Colonel. He is an author, a speaker, and a business consultant. He spent his professional life working all over the world, including Italy, Philippines, Kuwait, USA, Singapore, Thailand, Pakistan, the United Arab Emirates, and Afghanistan. From this worldly life experience, he has seen the world at its best and its worst. He knows what we have here in Australia, and he believes it is rare and it must be protected. So let's welcome Ricardo. My name is Ricardo Bosi. For 24 years, I served as an officer in the Australian Army. I took an oath to defend this country and its people, like so many before me who have taken that oath. Some have died, some have bled, but we all risked our lives for you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And we did it willingly, because we trusted our government to do its duty and to protect Australia and Australians. Unfortunately, that's no longer the case. As has already been mentioned, dual citizens have been sitting in our parliaments. The 45th Parliament of Australia, our current federal parliament, I believe is illegitimate. That means the laws that they have been passing are illegitimate. And they are not in Australia's best interest. Here today we probably have representatives from all parties Liberal, Labor, Conservatives There might even be the odd Green hiding in the back <laughs> And that's as it should be
Because we've now reached a point in our short history where it's no longer about left and right, it's about right and wrong. It's no longer about loyalty to a party, it's about loyalty to Australia. Yes. That's right. I never imagined that I'd be standing here speaking at a rally in defence of my own country. I never thought there'd be a need. But apparently there is a need, so here we are. And here we stand as free people. Nobody paid us to come, and we weren't forced to be here. We are a free people defending our freedom and the freedom of our families. That alone is the source of our strength and the source of our authority. That's all we need, and we're going to need it because we are at war. It is an economic, a political, and a cultural war. It is being waged by powerful international forces who are being aided and abetted by our morally cowardly, morally cowardly members of parliament. And we're on the receiving end. How do we know? Don't listen to what they say. Look at what they've done to the country. Just economically. Our power prices are so high that families can't warm themselves in winter. Factories can't run and they have to shut down. Our national debt is in excess of $500 billion, over half a trillion dollars. We can't pay it off. Our kids can't pay it off. And our grandkids can't pay it off. We're borrowing money to give to terrorists. Does this make sense to you? No. But we face a more pressing and longer lasting threat. They are attacking what it means to be Australian. They are attacking our culture. It's, a, it's based on a Judeo Christian foundation, Greek philosophy, Roman law, British individual rights, and so much more. This is what they don't understand. We've been told that this continent has been inhabited for 70,000 years, and that might be true, I don't know. But it's only in the last 250 years that we have created a culture and a society that is a wonder to the world. We are masters in every field of human endeavor, and we're good at it because of our culture. And we've created a family and a people who are friendly and easygoing and as willing to help out a stranger as we are a mate. Absolutely. And they want to attack it. Our government is trying to change the nature of our country. Out of control immigration and refugee programs are flooding the country with people who want to change us. Yes. And that's just not right. Mm -hmm. And here's the rub. Did they ask your permission? No. Imagine this. Bushfire. Your house is burning. So your neighbour says, come into my place. I'll look after you. But you have to live by his rules. And these rules might be rules that you've never seen or heard of before. They might be completely antithetical to your way of living. But you've got to live by his rules. It's the same with refugees. It's cruel to keep them here. Why keep them here away from their language, their culture, their people, their land, their customs? It doesn't make sense. It's better off to help them where they are, help them go home and rebuild their country. When I lived and worked in the Middle East, and I did for many years, as a courtesy, of course I obeyed the customs of the land. And we expect those who come here to do the same. Yeah. Respect our customs. Respect our laws. And if they don't like to, they can always go home. Yeah. They are free to leave. If we lose this fight, and it is a fight, to decide for ourselves what we are, to define ourselves as Australians, to choose what we like and don't like, the Australia that we have built, that our parents built and our grandparents built, will be lost forever. What you are seeing in Europe, what you are seeing in the UK, is a taste of things to come for Australia. Yes, definitely. This must stop now. Yes. Yes. In this place behind me, and in Canberra, and in every capital city where there's a parliament house, there's a breed of Quisling that lives inside. And they plan and scheme to enrich themselves and their mates, but not the people who voted for them, and not the people who pay their wages. They believe they are an elite. They're not. They are nothing.
without our money and without our vote, they are nothing. And they know it. We must unite politically. We must come together and use our vote to throw them out. Enough is enough and the time is now. We must select men and women who have proven themselves over the course of their careers. People we know, like and trust, who have the same values as us, who want to protect this country. They are the people we need to send to Parliament. Can we do it? Yes! Have a look at Trump in the US. Have a look at Brexit in the UK. We can do it here. We can do the same. At the next election, and it's not far away, folks, not very far away at all, we must select candidates by name, not by party. You can only select them as you look up. You understand where they come from and what they are doing. It's no longer about left and right, it's about right and wrong. Use your vote wisely. Ignore the party preferences. Vote below the line. Vote for one you know who will represent your values. We need to build an army. We need to build an army that will vote its conscience. We need to vote an army that will elect good men and women. And to make sure that the party hacks who are selling out Australia from under our noses never again see the inside of a parliament house. See inside a jail. (laughs) You have the power to say to these so-called elites, no more. It's in your hands. You have the power to take control of this country again. You have the power to change the course of our history. And you have the power, finally, to make sure that this country remains a powerful, wealthy, compassionate and free Western democracy. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I just want to say thank you now to Mitchell for organising this for having true Aussie pride. Yay! Thank you, Mitchell. Yay! Now, Mitchell, he's the head of the True Blue crew of New South Wales. Here's the reason we are here today and is the organiser of this Pride March. Mitch became very involved with protecting Australian culture when he became a father. And he wants to ensure... <laughs> He wants to assure the great Australia he grew up in will remain for his children and his grandchildren. Yeah. A big round of applause for Mitch Van Dam! Yeah. Big thank you to everyone for coming here today. Uh, I'm not much of a public speaker, but uh, I just, yeah. Good seeing all these different groups come together on the, on the one day, like the Lat Society, the True Blue Crew, we've got members from Reclaim Australia, 19CC, you know, we all need to start working together. We can't keep all this infighting and stuff going on between groups anymore. It is a problem. The left hate each other's guts, but they still unite at the end of the day when it, when it really matters. We need to start doing that. Um, it is an Australian Pride March, and we do have a lot to be proud of, as... Marxist left are always attacking our, our traditions and values like Christmas, Easter, they're even start on Mother's Day, Father's Day, yep. and you see it in the, all the time in the streets, the supermarkets, so they take Easter down, but they're happy to promote Ramadan, so, yep. yeah, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, just, I'd like to thank everyone, and yeah, make sure you all keep working together, and thank you. Alright guys, this has been unreal. We're gonna go have a drink now. Just one more thing, we've got Amelia here. She's uh doing a TV show thing going on and it's just to get our opinions now. That's the best thing, we want to get our opinions out there. So go and see her, grab a pamphlet and have a talk to her. And I'll see like all good Aussies, let's go have a beer. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.